So let me start with a personal introduction. Um, I grew up in a very racist, all-white working-class neighborhood. In 1961, I was 12. My father was 56. He was the only member of our extended family who was not a union member. He gets laid off. He can't find another job. We become extremely poor. Uh, by the time I'm 14 years old, I'm sleeping in an unheated garage. I went to work at age 12. I become incredibly angry about what has happened to us because my father had worked pretty much nonstop for 39 years, but nobody needed him at that point in life. He was facing AIDS discrimination, and he had no organization to back him up. And the racists in our neighborhood said, well, the reason that your dad is out of work is because black folk are lazy and they're taking all our jobs. And I was trying to understand, well, if black folk are all lazy, why would they want our jobs? And it made no sense to me. And so in one ear was the racism in my neighborhood, particularly against African Americans, and in my other ear were the messages of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was saying that we need to come together as a people and find a better way than what was going on in America. So I become what they call an at-risk youth. Luckily, I was getting almost straight A's, so they didn't expel me from high school. I figured out a way to disrupt class constantly, but I wasn't breaking any rules. So I got sent to the dean's office. They almost put a chair in there that was just for me, uh, because I was probably in there once every two or three weeks for three or four years. Uh, and they couldn't figure out, you know, what's wrong with this kid? And I said, well, I was really pissed. So I desperately wanted to go to college, and we had no money. And so I thought, well, my dream is never going to come true. And so I'm desperately trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? And one day I got a letter from a private college in Illinois that said, if you fill out this application, we'll give you full financial aid for four years if you'll come to our school. I had never talked to anybody from that school. I'd never heard of the place. I filled the application out. I sent it in the next day. A week later, I got a letter back and said, welcome to the class of 1971. And here's your financial aid package. So I was, I was beyond elated. And I, I went to school the next day, and I went to my guidance counselor, the poor woman who had to deal with me so many times because I was getting kicked out of class. And I told her what happened, and she smiled. And I said, why are you smiling? And she said, well, it worked. And I said, well, what worked? And she said, I've been giving your high school transcripts to these college recruiters and telling them to give you a chance and that you were a good kid. And I said, thank you, thank you. And then she said, but I didn't tell him what a pain in the neck you were. <laughs> and I said, thank you for that. You know, she was a school teacher, a union member, and a public employee. And today, those three groups of people are being accused of destroying our country and are the reason that everything is so effed up in this country. They were lying about it back then, and they're lying about it today. Right. Are you with me on this? And I have never forgotten that something that she was not required to do changed my life, and everybody that I've ever helped in my entire life owes her a debt of gratitude, even though she's six feet under. Okay. So I go to college, and I find out most of my financial aid comes from the federal government. And then I dug a little bit more and found out, well, where, how did we get these programs? And what I learned was that organized labor worked with the civil rights movement and educators to open up higher education to low-income kids, regardless of the color of their skin. Duh, what a moment this was. And I realized that I, and I jokingly refer to myself as an Irish pasty boy, I'm pretty white, I am a direct beneficiary of the civil rights movement. And I have never forgotten that if we come together and stand shoulder to shoulder and lock arms with each other and work across our differences and honor and respect our differences, there's nothing that we can't do as working people to create an American dream for everybody. <laughs> this is my 327th speech workshop and training in the last six years for 27 international unions in 18 states. I am really honored to be here. My brother John joined Local 131 48 years ago. He's getting a pension from the Carpenters. So, you know, you're a little bit of home to me. Uh, and thank you for all the work that you do. But we have got to get smarter and get stronger and bring more people into this fight 
to make sure that the future is as bright as it should be for everybody in this country, regardless of who they are, what they look like, where they come from, what God they worship, who they choose to love, and what language they may speak. This is a fight that we all got to weigh into, and we got to get reinforcements for the fight. You with me on this? Yeah. 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 This is the future. And so I want to talk to you not just as Carpenter Union leaders, but also as family members and as community members. Not just a narrow role in your union, but we are all part of extended families, and we're all part of communities. And that this fight affects everybody that we know. Okay? So, what, so you know a little bit about me. Now, I want to start asking you a few questions, but I want to tell you what are we going to do here. First, we're going to find our common ground. Then we're going to take a look at what's the war on workers look like today? What do people think of unions today? The divide and conquer strategies that corporate America has used in the past to keep us weak. What our ancestors did to overcome that divide and conquer strategy. A group exercise on income inequality to sort of dramatize what has been done to us against our will. The divide and conquer strategy of today and what are people doing it about today and then have a discussion about well, what have we learned from this conversation that we're going to have. And I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, I'm going to give this copy of this PowerPoint to the council so you can do whatever you want with it. You can post it on your website, make it available to anybody who's here, any one of your members or you can go to my website. There are similar versions to this on my website. So I'm about freeware and spreading the word as best I'm able. So I want to ask you questions about you, your extended families, not just your nuclear family, but your aunts, your uncles, your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, and then your close friends and their extended families. I'm not talking about somebody you kind of know, but people that you feel some kind of emotional connection to. And these are personal questions. And what I'd like you to do, if you're willing to do it, is to raise your hand and look around the room every time the answer to one of these questions is yes. Are you willing to do this with me? Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Yes. I'm into crowds yelling, okay? So that'll be part of the energy to keep you awake until we're done. So in the last number of years, you know anybody who lost a job or can't find a family wage, good paying job? How many people? Probably about 85% of you. How about it's tough paying the bills or the rent or the mortgage? Probably 80% of you. How about worried about adequate income and retirement? You can raise both hands on this if you want, or you can alternate arms. Okay? About 80% of you. Discriminated against because of who they are. Look at this. Probably two thirds of you. College is too expensive or have large student loans. I like have a lot of people raising both arms on this one. I'm raising my hand every time because it's true for me too. I'm not outside of this. How about lost or didn't have health insurance? 75% of you. Weren't paid wages that were legally owed. Now look around the room. What is more basic in America than when we tell people that they ought to go get a job, right? Quit being lazy, go get a job. And over half of you raised your hands because you know somebody who can't force their employer to give them the wages they're legally owed. If you do that with a gun, you go to the joint and you wear orange. If you do it with a pencil, it's a good business practice and it increases your bottom line. What is wrong with our country that anybody in this room should raise their hand? That's how far we have sunk as a country that anybody in this room should know this. And last but not least, worry about rising racism, sexism, and bigotry. <coughs> Virtually everybody in the room. So we have a lot more in common in here than you're just all activists or staff or leaders in the Carpenters Union. There is a much deeper set of bonds, and I hope you will keep thinking about those bonds as we go through this workshop today. Do you feel like the federal government is dominated by corporate America and their political allies and they don't really give a rip about you? Yeah. I couldn't hear you on that one. Yeah. Okay, we got another level of common ground. Do you believe corporate America and their political allies are trying to destroy our movement and steal the future from the people we love? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we got another level of common ground. So now, what I want to do 
is I want you to turn to the person next to you and for 60 seconds tell them how do you feel about these issues that we were just raising our hands or yelling about and then flip it around and then I'm going to ask you one at a time to give me one or two words, not a sentence, not a monologue, about how you feel about these issues that we just were raising. Our hands. Okay, now I'm going to I'm going to see if we can do this exercise without using the mics. So I would ask you to use your extremely loud outdoor voice and start telling me in one or two words how do you feel about what's been happening to you. Just you can yell it out. Frustrated. Okay, just a sec. Oh. Okay, just a sec. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll try and get them all. Ashamed, disgusted, betrayed, hopeless, betrayed, robbed, embarrassed, hopeless, intimidated, robbed, say it again, Jimmy, embarrassed, embarrassed, embarrassed. I'm going to just use ashamed, sort of similar to embarrassed, scared, scared. <laughs> How about one more? Lied to. Lied to. Yeah. Okay, without getting hung up on whether or not we used the exact right words and whether or not we got the exact feelings that you feel, does this set of feelings of frustrated, ang uh, mad, PO'd, anxious, driven, scared, lied to, ashamed, disgusted, betrayed, hopeless, and robbed, does that capture how a lot of the people that you know and love care about about what's been happening? Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Here's another level of common ground. You're all carpenters. You're all in the, you know, working with the union. But you got a lot of ways in which your people have been hurt and hit. You think the government is clearly not working for you. Yes. Right? And you got a whole set of negative feelings about it. So, next question. You want to take our country and government back so that it'll serve us again? Okay. Another level of common ground, and the last one. You think your union and our movement needs more allies in this fight? Yes. yes. I couldn't hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. I use this exercise with almost everybody to get a feel for, I told you who I am, I, I revealed something in my heart, and you revealed something about who you are. Above and beyond, you know, I'm in local this, that, and the other, and my job title is X, and I've worked in, you know, been a car for 19 years or whatever, worked in the office, okay? So you have a lot in common here. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat their mistakes. He, George Santayana said this 80 years ago, and he was basically describing what I call the game films of working people's struggles to build the American dream. And when you study the game field, you look at what we did right, and we look at what we did wrong, and we look what our opponents did right and wrong, and we make adjustments. And any pro team that doesn't make adjustments after looking at the game films is gonna get their blank handed to them in the second half or the next game, right? So I would argue that our movement also has to look at our successes our failures, our wins, and our losses, and what can we learn from them? Because anybody who's trained anybody, or been trained, you learn sometimes best by figuring out, well, why did I make that mistake? Wrong tool, wrong measurement, whatever. And the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. The captains of industry did not lead this transformation. At our best, Dr. King was saying, we're the good guys and the good gals of American history. He didn't say we were perfect. He didn't say we hadn't made any mistakes. But he said, in aggregate, we are a shining beacon of hope and light for the American people. Okay? And he was very clear. It was not the billionaires and the fat cats who led this transformation. It was us. And of course, he died in Memphis 50 years ago at a strike, an illegal strike for union recognition and a first contract of sanitation workers. He didn't die just a civil rights hero, he died a labor hero and a labor martyr. Okay?
And depending on who controls the microphone, you may not hear a lot of this. Because corporate America is not interested in sharing this side of Dr. King's story. Because this is, this is more radical and more threatening in many ways. So, corporate America knows that Dr. King is right. Okay, they're not stupid. This is the percentage of workers in the United States that are unionized. If you go to the early 1900s, it's about 12%. It remains flat until the mid-30s, except for World War I, and then corporate America smashes us. The great people's uprising and union uprising in the 1930s, our movement triples in size. It starts to come down. This is Ronald Reagan. We lose 30% of our members in three years, and today we're at 10.5%, which is the lowest it's been in almost 90 years. And the red is the private sector, which is mainly you. It's at 6.5%. It's the lowest it's been since 1900. Their war on workers is working, brothers and sisters. And if we don't push this up, goodbye pensions, goodbye good money, goodbye bright future for you and your kids and your grandkids. So I'm saying it is game on, not just for our next contract. It is game on for my kids and my grandkids, and I've got an eight-day-old grandson, and I am fighting for him. Yeah. Right. I got mine, we're doing okay, but I want the same things that I got for my eight-day-old grandson, and I'm gonna keep working and pushing until I'm too tired to get up here and run my mouth, okay? Because we gotta we got we got hand off a better future to the people that we love who are younger than us, rather than where corporate America is trying to send us. Divide and conquer. This has been their strategy for decades. Right to work, okay? One of the great evils of American history. This is a guy named Vance Muse. Straight up racist. Listen to this. From now on, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their job. Vance, you can go straight to hell on a high-speed train, and I'll pay your ticket to get there. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and let us never forget that the merger of smashing labor and racism, you can't pull them apart. Okay? They're, they're like a, a, a cloth that's woven together. And of course, in 1947, with the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, one of the dark days in American history, they gave states the right to have right-to-work laws. Does everybody in here know what a right-to-work law is? Raise your hand if you know. If you don't, I'll tell some of you. OK, a few of you don't. A right-to-work law says that it's illegal to have a clause in a union contract that says that everybody has to be a union member. So even if you have a contract with a company, you can't have a union security clause. And that means that people can work there who are non-union. They get the same rights, benefits, and protections without being a union member and without having to pay union dues. OK? I just tried that with State Farm. I called them up and said, I like the right to work auto insurance policy. I'm, I don't want to pay, but my neighbor does. And they said, boom, click. End of story. But that's what they're doing. OK? And there's a case in front of the Supreme Court, Janus, that's coming up probably next month. They're going to try and put right to work in in all 50 states for all public sector workers. Okay? They're coming to slit our throats. And by God, it is game on. I'm not here to tell you to vote for, but I'm here to tell you the truth. The 2016 Republican National Program Platform, National Right to Work Law for the private sector, that's you guys, you guys and gals, repeal Davis Bacon, okay? ban project labor agreements, and get rid of that pesky federal minimum wage, which is bankrupting companies at $7.25 an hour. How can companies possibly survive if they have to pay such outrageous wages? I'm obviously kidding. That's $15,000 a year if you work 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. That's called starvation wages in the United States. That's, that's like make sure you get your blanket all together so you can get under a bridge, because that's where you're going to be living. Okay. And I'll tell you, as somebody who was about two steps from being homeless when I was a kid, it still gives me the willies 
50 years later, when I drive by and see people sleeping under bridges and sleeping in doorways. Because we were one step removed from that, and we managed to beat it back. But I'm scarred by that for the rest of my life. And Mr. Trump says, I can live with unions where I have to, but I'm 100%, but I like right to work. My position is 100% right to work. I went and listened to this audio tape so that I could say, I actually heard the guy say, okay, no pulling any punches here. 27 states, all these states now have right to work laws. And I think you've got uh, Wyoming and Idaho. You know, you got two out of six, and I'm sure they'd like to spread it all, every one of our states, if they can figure out a way to do it. It's come, they're, they're coming to get us, and by God, we have to not play just defense, we gotta play offense. All these light-colored states do not have a state prevailing wage law, okay? So they're trying to bust us down everywhere they can. Last year, the Department of Labor began repealing an Obama-era regulation that said when a company hires a union-busting firm, a labor management consulting firm, to help figure out a way to get rid of the union or to keep the union from getting in, they, that information has to be publicly available so that we at least know who's doing it and how much money is being spent. They are repealing that rule so that information will no longer be public. How many of you think that's a bad idea? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, this is the power of the pen. It doesn't require congressional approval. The U.S. Department of Transportation killed a pilot project to help use uh, in project labor agreements, ways to help bring more diversity into the industry. Okay? Once again, just chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And then, believe it or not, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has ruled that large companies do not have to report wages based on job, sex, race, and ethnicity. What possible purpose is there in not having to report this? So you can get away with pay discrimination and it's more difficult to prove. What public purpose does that serve other than to aid and abet systematic discrimination and ripping off workers some wages and being fairly treated. Anybody think this is a bad idea? Yes. Yeah. How many of you knew about this? You know about, you know, about five of you, okay? And your, your leaders, they're doing this stuff, well, hey, look at that clown over there. But meanwhile, they're slashing and burning at rights that we have fought for to try and bring more justice and fairness and equity into our country. Brother here is named Alphonse Madden. He's an over-the-road trucker in the Midwest. It's 27 below zero, blinding blizzard. The brakes on the trailer freeze. He can't move the load. The company has a policy that says if you abandon the load, we'll fire you. Okay? He calls up HQ and explains the situation. You gotta stay with the load. And he goes, it's 27 below zero, and the, and the snow is you know flying horizontal. I'm from the Midwest, I know about this. You can't freeze to death. And they said, you got to stay. And he goes, well, I'm not doing that. So he gets out, unhooks the trailer, drives off the tractor, goes and gets a truck mechanic, brings the mechanic back. The mechanic gets the brakes unfrozen, reattaches the load, and hauls it off and delivers it. No harm, no foul, no load loss. The company fires him. Yeah, no kidding. You, you could be fired if you do something, if you break a company rule because you think you may die. So they work it up through the courts. They get to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one step below the U.S. Supreme Court. The judges rule six to one in favor of Alphonse. The one guy who voted against it was a guy named Neil Gorsuch. He was just appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court and, a, and approved by Congress. He's gonna be making decisions about worker rights and health and safety for the rest of my life. How many think this is effed up? Yeah, I got a 30% permanent partial disability in my left hand. Okay, you can probably see that, a little funky there. 
got mangled in a machine once upon a time when I was a machinist, where I lost my the job at a union bus. Another story, but it's another day. Point is, they're trying to pack this system so that we working people can't build our movement and build our strength and bring people together, and we cannot let them succeed because if they do, the world, the country and world that we hand to our kids and our grandkids is not one we're going to feel good about. You with me on that? Yeah. 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 If anybody needs any motivation, go home and look at your kids and your grandkids, particularly your grandkids, and go, I don't care about what happens to you, Nash. You know, too bad for you, Trump. I got a good deal. Can't do that because I love it. <coughs> so people accuse me of depressing them. Evelyn, what did you bring this guy here for? Like, I want to throw myself off, the, off my chair. Okay? But here's an example of a huge win. In Iowa, they passed this incredibly punitive right to work law for the public sector that says before you bargain a new contract, you have to hold a new recertification election every time you're going to negotiate a new contract. And in order to win the recertification election, you have to get more than 50% of everybody in the bargaining unit, not 50 percent plus one of the people who voted. So if there's a thousand people in the bargaining unit, we get 500 yes votes and zero no votes. The union is decertified because it didn't win a majority. I am not kidding you. And by the way, that is the standard of the Railway Labor Act, which is a federal law that regulates trucking and, uh, and airlines and railroads. Uh, railroads and airlines, believe it or not. So in Iowa, they, last year they had to go through recertification elections, 435 of them. They won 425. The vote was 28,400 yes, 600 no. A 98% yes vote with an 88% turnout. How many of you heard about this? Okay, sisters and brothers, we gotta figure out a way to just to get this information out, let's give it up for our brothers and sisters in Iowa. <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. Oh my gosh, it's all doom and gloom. Well, screw that. We gotta go out and talk to every member face to face and say, listen, I'm telling you that this is gonna directly affect you and your family and your kids and your grandkids, and I'm telling you, you need to come out and vote. If I got your vote, and you do it every one, every one, every one. The old back to the very grassroots. 88% turnout, there is no such thing as 88% turnout in any political election in the United States. And Jimmy Hahn, I'm sure, can verify this. Right? Not even close. And if you had a standard of 50% plus one of all the people who are eligible to vote, nobody would have ever been elected president of the United States. So why would we have that standard to determine whether or not you can have a union? Because they can get away with it. Okay? And we got to put an end to this and throw these people into the dumpster of history and rebuild our future. You with me so far? Yeah. Yeah. Game on. So what do the American people think of unions? I hear people say all the time, oh, people hate unions. Oh, they're overpaid, they're corrupt, they got three guys on a shovel. I mean, cripe almighty, drive by that construction site. How'd they ever get anything done with everybody who's leaning on the shovel? Or whatever they were doing, you know, hiding and looking for two by fours or something. Right? So, the Gallup poll has been asking the same question since 1936 of the American people. Do you approve of unions? Very simple question. Starting in 1936 through the mid-60s, it was about two-thirds, 65 to 70 percent. It crashes in the 70s, it comes back in the early 80s, it stays at 60 percent, and then it crashes in the Great Recession to the only time in 80 years it's been less than 50 percent, and now it's been rising every year since 2008. Okay, so anybody who tells you that the American people do not approve of unions, ask them for their evidence. Talk's cheap. I'll, back, I'll put my money on Gallup poll versus some guy I'm having a beer with who pulled it out of his ear or pulled it out of his tailpipe or wherever he got this alleged information from. It's like, what's your evidence? 
And if you don't have any evidence, then, then let's look. And there, there are other polls that show similar kinds of data. I'm not making this up. This is all footnoted, by the way, because some people accuse me of lying. And I go, OK, I'm betting on Gallup poll. How'd you do your poll? Well, you didn't do one. OK, another, another story. Pop quiz. This is pass fail. OK, as far as I know. There's four age groups here. Which of these four age groups do you think are most pro-union? How many think it's 18 to 29 year olds? Okay, pretty good vote. How about 30 to 49? A few of you. 50 to 64. Okay, and 65 and older. Yeah, I'm over 65, and boy, we really took it in the chin there. Okay. So 18 to 29, I had a pretty solid plurality there. And how about members? How many think it's men? I'm going to educate your members here. How many think it's women? Okay, and the answers are 18 to 29 year olds by a landslide. In fact, the older you get, the more less likely you are to approve the unions. Hello? So by gosh, we got this millennial generation coming up that national polling repeatedly shows they approve the unions even though most of them have no experience, direct experience with unions. Okay? And then when it's men versus women, women win by a landslide. So it's young people and women. And then when you ask low-wage workers making 15 bucks an hour or less, do you, are you favorable to unions? 87% of African Americans say yes, almost 80% of Latinos and almost 70% of whites. The American people increasingly get it, that they need a union. But boy, has there a machine in place to make it really difficult to get one, and I'm preaching to the choir on that one, right? Okay. But what kind of a democracy is it where you say, I'd like to, I'd like to join an organization that's going to improve my situation. You're fired. You like working here, don't you? It's been great working with you. We like, really like to keep that teamwork together. What was your name again? Okay, yeah, fired. Is that, did you change your name? You get the picture. People live in fear. Because if I lose my job and there's no health insurance and there's no this and there's no that, oh my God, boss man, whatever you're going to deal, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kiss your boot. Am I, am I speaking the truth here? Yeah. 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 It, is, it is game on. And by God, the support of the American people is growing. And so now, another opportunity to talk to yourselves for a couple of minutes, talk to somebody you didn't talk to before. Why do you think public support is going up? And why do you think it's young people, women, and people of color who are most pro-union? Why do you think public support for unions is rising again? What's going on here? Why is this? Yes? People are getting more educated. People are getting more educated. So they're learning more about unions could be good for them. That, okay? And people are getting better educated in general. So what else might be going on? Social media. Social media, access to more information. Social equity. Social equity, say just a little bit more if you would. We fought for equality. They're seeing the, uh, the injustice of equality versus equity. So rise in injustice, is that a fair way yeah. to put that? A rise in injustice. What else might be going on here? Yes. I think the unions have also changed. Unions have changed. And they did some really bad things back in the 70s and 80s and were uh, like a, an exclusive club. And now they're being more inclusive and all are welcome. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Unions are changing, made some mistakes in the past, particularly in the 70s and 80s, exclusive, becoming more inclusive, becoming more open and, and more welcoming. Yes, brother. Yeah, in, a, in our table, we think that by answering the second question first, we answer the first question, meaning the, pe the young people, the people of color and the ladies, they don't have the entitlement that, you know, I'm sorry to say, you know, a lot of white, white people, th uh, male things that they have. So we try to be inclusive and get equally in, in, uh, to be part of the union or of a movement. Okay. We're running out of options. Running out of options. Stagnant wages. You know, 
I did a, I did a poll recently. I asked 10 baristas if they'd been to college and all 10 of them said yes. And the average student debt for them was 45,000 bucks. There's nothing wrong with going to college if that's what somebody wants to do. But the idea that you come out and you're working as a barista, there's nothing wrong with being a barista either. It's honest work. But how in the world are they ever going to pay off their debt? Exactly. Right? And it's like, what kind of a ripoff is this? So what else might be going on that would be causing, yes? Um, one of the other things that I'm seeing is the younger generation want to belong to something or be part of something. And they're more collaborative and more succeed. So young are more collaborative. I also think that um, why women and people of color choosing unions because they have standardized wages and benefits. When we get paid the same thing as the men. So standard wages and benefits, if you're in a union, regardless of who you are, what you look like, who you love, you get the same deal. Right? They can't say, you know, you don't look like me, so you don't get as much as I do. Yes? You get the training. Come and journeyman through the apprenticeship, and you can go work anywhere in the United States. You're not stuck in one spot. You go for it. When you get a job like in whatever. So you, you get training, you got more options, you got more leverage. You know, the employer can't just say, there's 50 people out there who can do your job, why don't you just shut up and do exactly as I, as I tell you to, right? So you get training, you get more options. What else might be going on? Yes? How about we look at the current presidency right now and we got to figure out, we know that we got to do something to beat back you know, his momentum, the things that are going on in the White House right now. We need to fight forward. <laughs> What else might be going on that would be causing young people and people of color and women and the public in general to be increasingly pro-union again? Yes. Well, you can only lie for so long before the truth comes out. Thank you. Thank you. The lies only work so long. Okay. And as Hitler once said, and his, uh, his henchman, a guy named Joseph Goebbels once said, if you tell a big, big, big enough lie loud enough and long enough, it will eventually become the truth. Well, we are, the, we are the lie busters here. We have to be the truth tellers. Okay? The lie show works. So one other comment. What, what's going on here? Yes, the young lady in the back. Seeing the benefits and having benefits. There was not a, yeah. a lot of people don't have the ability to have benefits, and I think the younger generation might have grown up in a situation where they didn't have any, and they realized the importance of it. Yeah, thank you. If I could just add one of my own. A few years ago, I asked a 25-year-old woman who is a, a, a young uh, activist, a labor activist, I said, why are, why are young people and women so pro-union? Pro, pro and she looked at me like there was a horn coming out of my forehead, and she said, duh, we're the people with three part-time jobs, we're the people with $40,000 in student debt, we're the people having to move back home, now, even though we got educated and we can't figure out how to you know, make a living, we're the ones that can't afford to buy a house, can't afford to buy a car. And she's like getting more and more cranked up. And I finally went, whoa, 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 chill, girl. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I was just trying to understand. And she said, it's those kind of reasons. We get it. We're not just a bunch of screw-ups here. We're trying to do the right thing. And boy, the opportunities are getting tough. Right? And the unions provide real opportunities and some kind of defense against the giant ripoff of, no, I'm not going to pay you your wages this week. Thank you very much. You don't like it? See what you can do about it. And by the way, see those four people out there? I'll bring one in to replace you right now. Are you with me on this? Yeah. Yeah. So I would argue, and I hope you agree, that this growing pro-union sentiment is something that we need to figure out how to tap into in a positive way, and for people my age to be humble enough to be willing to listen to 25-year-olds and learn from them, just as I hope that they're willing to learn and listen from me. Because I can't see the world through their eyes. So we got to learn intergenerational cooperation and respectful listening. Not just, I'm older than you, so shut up and, 
because I'm older than you. Therefore, I, I know more. Of course, they could say, well, how come the labor movement went down the tank, went in the tank while you were involved, McDermott? <laughs> whoa, 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 let's not look at the data too carefully here. <laughs> okay? And so it's a respectful way to listen to each other and learn from each other and how to communicate better because they communicate differently than I do, other than we all use our models. So now we're going to do a history lesson. Bang, we're in a time machine, we're in the 1890s. Railroads are king, heavy industry is on the rise. This is the massacre of the Wounded Knee, which completes almost three centuries of stealing what is now the United States from our native brothers and sisters. And this is the hideous conditions of Jim Crow and vicious racism in the South. Okay? It is not an easy time. And in 1886, the Supreme Court says that corporations are legal persons. Now we have two kinds of legal persons. We got uh, people like us, who when we cut, we bleed red. And then you got these legal persons called corporations. When you cut them, they bleed green. And there has been a struggle in this country now for 132 years about which persons should have the upper hand in determining how should our country go. Okay? There's not one word in the US Constitution of, our cor of corporation, but by God, somehow they ended up with the same rights we got, and they are beating us to death with rights that I would argue they never should have had. Samuel Gompers, head of the American Federation of Labor. What does labor want? We want more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge, more opportunities to make childhood more happy and bright. Does that sound pretty good today? Yeah. Couldn't hear you. Yeah. yeah. The question was, when he said it, did he mean all workers? Yes. OK? And I'm going to show you that I would argue he didn't. Okay, Because there's some ugly stuff in our history that we need to be willing to cop to. And this thing about childhood more happy and bright, I had a tough childhood. But compared to my grandparents, they went to work at age 10 and age 12 in a brickyard and in a factory. Got a third and fifth grade education. They never got a chance to get educated and reach for their dreams. I did. Because I'm standing on the shoulders of generations of unionists and other allies who said, we're going to give our kids a better shot than we have. That was part of the promise of our country, is our kids are going to have a chance to do more than we did if that's how they want to go. And, and they have choices. Of course, the military and the National Guard and the police are repeatedly used to break strikes. This is the great strike in the south side of Chicago. At Pullman, Pullman Standard, rail car manufacturer. I've been to this place. Uh, and it was the whip hand of corporate power that crushed the unions repeatedly over the decades, hundreds and hundreds of times. But in the darkest days of the greatest oppression in American history to date, in the 1890s, the people rose up and pushed Congress to put in an income tax that only applied to the richest 10% of families. Because they were desperate. There was no unemployment insurance. There was no Medicaid. There was no Medicare. There was no public housing. There was literally starvation and hunger across the country. And they said, let's make the fat cats that we produce all the wealth for pay something so that we've got something to live on. And the corporate-dominated Supreme Court stepped in and said, it's unconstitutional. So we win, and then we get knocked down by the courts. But the fight wasn't over. Two years later, this is the corporate candidate, McKinley. This is the people's champion, William Jennings Bryan. McKinley outspends Bryan 11 to 1. This was the first American election that was bought by corporate money. Okay, he narrowly won the election, but when you outspend them 11 to 1, I guarantee you, you're probably going to win. Okay, and so dark clouds came over the country while the depression continued, as the corporate candidate says, it's going to be the whip hand, and there's going to be no unions in America if they have their way. And of course, a key part of staying in power was voter suppression. In 1888, a coalition of African Americans and poor whites in Mississippi elected a progressive governor, government that started passing laws that favored the poor and working people regardless of the color of their skin. 
And the, and the ruling class in Mississippi said, we're going to put an end to this, and they did. Using racist terror, lynchings, and mass murder of African Americans, 3,200 of them in 30 years across the South, mainly in the South, not exclusively. And this was a famous quote, we wrested our state government from Negro supremacy. What does Negro supremacy mean? It means that whites and blacks came together and voted for some black folks and elected them to office in what's called a democratic election in a democracy. That's what they meant. And so we're going to make sure that that never happens again. So they took the right to vote away, and in 40 years, voter participation dropped from 70 to less than 10%. Okay? And this went on all across the South. And they, not, they took the right to vote away from virtually every black person. They took the right to vote away from most of the white working class, too. Okay? By a variety of means. And so democracy was a complete sham in many parts of the country. And the South becomes the bastion of anti-union uh, power in the country, not the only place. And of course, we have a president who is a bigot. Wilson, he was a Democrat. He starts to resegregate the federal government. And this is what he says about immigrants. Southern European countries are unburdening themselves of the more sordid and hapless elements of their population. Eastern Europeans had neither the skill nor energy nor any initiative of quick intelligence. So they're basically stupid. So if you're Polish or Czech or Slovak or Bulgarian or Hungarian or Greek or Jewish, those people are Italian. Those people who were immigrating to the United States during this period are a bunch of scumbags and morally and intellectually inferior to us Northwestern Europeans. So they're stirring up hatred against immigrants while the working people are getting the bejeebers beaten out of them. Okay? Divide and conquer a critical tool. Anybody ever heard these quotes from a president before? <laughs> okay, okay, you're getting ahead of yourself here. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little later on. Okay? There's, there, this is an ugly American tradition. Okay, let's not pretend it didn't exist. This is the south side of Chicago, meatpacking by people from Chicago. Five strikes in 29 years, tens of thousands of packers striking for recognition, long hours, brutal conditions, very dangerous, low pay, and they lose all five strikes because they're fighting amongst themselves. And of course, the boss is brilliant. This is what I call strategic racism. We pursue policies to keep the races and nationalities apart. Stir up suspicion, rivalry, and hatred among them. This isn't some ignorant bigot out in the bush somewhere. This is some guy who's well-educated, who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, saying, we got to teach people to hate each other. And when we do, we run the tables. So what happens? The Irish are fighting the Germans. The Germans are fighting the Italians. The Italians are fighting the Slovaks. And maybe they'll you know, gang up on some Jewish folks. And if there's any blacks or Latinos around, try and blame them. And every time they did it, it was morally wrong. They played into the hands of the bosses and hurt themselves and they hurt other people. And so hanging on to this racism and bigotry was bad for everybody, except the fat cats who were running off with the dough saying, what a bunch of chumps. We can play these fools forever. You with me on this? Yes. Yeah. This is an age old tactic. Any of this sound vaguely familiar to 2018? Yeah. Okay, don't, don't get ahead of yourselves. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of warming you up for the second half. Our labor movement was also infected with growing racism, okay? This is part of the history that Brother Jimmy was talking about. In the early 20th century, the number of unions that specifically black, uh, banned African Americans from membership almost triples from four to 11. Can't blame this on the bosses. This is stuff that our own unions did. Okay? And I would argue it was morally wrong, but politically and economically it was really stupid. And it hurt people because it kept our movement weak. Okay? And by 1925, the Ku Klux Klan is larger than the entire labor movement. How many of you knew that? Raise your hand. Okay, look around the room. You got a small number here who knew this. 
They had four to five million members in 1925. In today's America, if they had the same percentage, it'd be 12 to 15 million. They're a domestic terrorist organization. They had blacks, Jews, Catholics, Latinos. Who else? Everybody. Jews. Anybody who wasn't just like them, they're strike breakers. Okay? So how in the world are you going to build a labor movement if you've got millions of white working class people joining the Ku Klux Klan? And then you've got to work next to somebody who's, you know, an immigrant from, uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia or from uh, Jamaica or wherever. How are you going to do that? Or they're, or they're Catholic and you're Protestant or they're Jewish or, or, or Serbian Orthodox or whatever it is. You can't come together if you're saying because you're a little bit different than me, you're my enemy. How can we become brothers and sisters if that's the, the mentality, the disease that infects people? And it's being consciously stirred up as a strategy to maintain corporate domination. And of course, they had culture wars back then. Birth control is banned. If you, if you sent birth control devices across a state line, you can go to the federal pen. Yeah, like a diaphragm or condoms or information about birth control. Hello. Women shouldn't have the right to vote. Interracial marriages are banned in many states. In fact, in 1967, when the Supreme Court struck it down, there were 20 states in the country where it was illegal for people of different races to marry each other. It's like, hello? What, what business does the government have saying, I can't love somebody who looks different than me? Stir up that hatred. Stir up that hatred. Alcohol prohibition is an attack on immigrants and Catholics and Jews. Yeah, they use it in the sacraments. What are those Catholics doing? Then they're getting drunk. What are those Jews doing every Friday night when they're celebrating, you know, the Sabbath? Oh, they're, they're drinking. Oh, my gosh. You know, you know how the immigrants are. They're all a bunch of alcoholics anyway. Stirring up that hatred. And the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, is a, pure, is a defender of pure white America. So our country is bitterly divided, bitterly divided. And the, one of the main reasons and the effects of it is, here we are, this is the percentage of workers in the country that are unionized. By 1904, it's about 12%. It basically does not change in over 30 years, despite thousands and thousands of strikes and hundreds of thousands of dedicated unionists trying to build our movement. So we're so split up around race and creed and color and national origin and religion and gender that we can't come together and say, I, I, even though you're different than me, you're still my brother, you're still my sister. And I want to learn more about you. And hopefully you'll want to learn about me so we can stick together and make it better for everybody that we love and care about. Because that's the unity, that's what union means. We're sticking up for everybody. Not just sticking up for people who look like me or look like you. Thank gosh there's nobody in this room with a baseball hat on backwards because that's the one group that I just can't handle. <laughs> you know how those people are. What are they really up to? I mean, you gotta wonder. I mean, I know, I, I know, it, it sounds bad, but you know, I mean, if, oh, we got somebody doing it. Hold it, hold it, get a camera on it. <laughs> You know, I, I still love you, brother. I really do. I, I'm, gonna, I'm working past this. But the point is, there are always ways that we can be encouraged to hate and distrust each other. Somebody should have to earn that, not just because you look at them. And, we, and, and as the brother was talking this morning, you look at somebody and make some assumptions and go, oh my God, people like you couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly want to have anything to do with you because you're one of them. So our labor movement's not making ground, but we're, we're winning some huge democratic wins, small d democracy. We pass a federal law that basically bans corporate money in elections in 1907, and then we win two constitutional amendments where we finally get to directly elect our US senators, which up until that time, were elected by the legislatures. And we also got a constitutional amendment for an income tax, poked the Supreme Court right in the eye and said, okay, you say it's unconstitutional, we just made it constitutional, and it only applied to the richest 2%. Who, 
who were making out like bandits while my ancestors were struggling to put a roof over their head. Okay? So it wasn't all gloom and doom. We were fighting on multiple fronts. And we were fighting to break up these huge corporations called trusts. This is Standard Oil, which was the biggest of the bad boys, right here. He's strangling the White House. Well, here's Congress strangling the White House, strangling state legislators, because they got their tentacles into everything. And so we're breaking up the big corporations and weakening their power. And of course, you know, women and immigrants, everybody knows women couldn't possibly organize, and immigrants were a hopeless bunch. This is one of my heroes, Clara Lemwich. She's 19 years old. She's a Ukrainian Jewish immigrant in the Lower East Side of New York City. Hideous conditions in the garment industry in the city. She's had a huge rally, huge union meeting. They used to say you couldn't even organize women. When we showed them, I listened to all the speakers, and I say, I have no patience for any more talk. Let's hit the bricks. I call for a general strike. And 20,000 workers went out on strike. And for eight weeks, yeah, yeah. for eight weeks they battled the police and company gunmen and company thugs, and they they won the first contract in hundreds of garment shops. And this was part of the founding of a powerful labor movement in New York City. And of course, it was led a lot by women, almost all immigrants, sort of disproving that women and immigrants couldn't figure out how to organize anything which was complete and utter nonsense. It was just another form of ignorant bigotry. Okay? And uh, she's, she's one of those unknown American heroines. I ought to have pictures of her up on a wall somewhere as the people who helped change America. And of course, women are fighting for the right to vote. <coughs> a radical idea. There's a march down Pennsylvania Avenue. There's Congress in the background. There's 5,000 of them. They're so violently attacked, they have to bring out the US Army to protect them. <laughs> 100, of them went to, 100 of them were sent to the hospital. They kept coming. They kept coming. And in 1920, it took 313 years since the settlers got out of Jamestown to where women finally got the right to vote. They never gave up, and they never stopped fighting. And they had men who were helping them. <laughs> now, Nothing good ever came easy, brothers and sisters. Nothing good ever came easy. And of course, if you can't win at the federal level, then let's go at it at the states like Jimmy and the other folks are doing, you know, trying to push through progressive legislation. This is what we're winning in the early 20th century. Initiatives, referendums, public ports, workers' comp. Starting to change and expand and strengthen our democracy. So you, you stop us at the federal level, We'll fight you at the state level, and we'll keep moving forward. And of course, then the Depression comes. And you know, one of the things about a bread line and a soup line is everybody's equal, because everybody's begging for food, and their stomach is growling. My grandfather in Detroit, an unemployed auto worker, gets hit by a streetcar, suffers severe internal injuries. They take him to the hospital. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any health insurance. They send him home, they bandage him up, they send him home with a death sentence. Yeah, this is what it was like when we didn't have any power. No Medicare, no Medicaid, no union insurance, no nothing. Sorry, Adelbert Wabel, you're dead. Yeah, yeah. You look back into your family histories, you'll find some really hard times that were unjust. If you bother to look, I guarantee it. And of course, 16 million people are out of work, so let's blame it on the Mexicans. Hey, there's a great idea. OK, so there's 16 million out of work, so we're going to throw 1 to 2 million Mexican Americans and Mexicans out of the country. What about the other 14 million that are out of work? Were the Mexicans responsible for that, too? How's this work? It's just another round of bigotry. Let's whip up hatred. They're rounding them up at gunpoint. Hey, hey. I'm an American citizen, I got three kids in the LA school. Shut up, you look like a Mexican to me. But, but, but. Before you know it, he's in Tijuana. And then your kids get out of school and go, where's dad? Well, there's no cell phones, okay? They, you know, probably don't have a phone in your house. Dad disappeared. Now what? Okay? 
So they were stirring up the hatred. But we came together. And in other workshops I do, we spent a lot of time on how this worked in the 30s. This is what I call the great uprising of the people in the 1930s. We turned the tide. We built a powerful labor movement. We built allies in the community like never before. And to drive home that point, W.B. Du Bois, Du Bois, who was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, said, probably the greatest and most effective effort toward interracial understanding among the working masses has come through the trade unions. He didn't say the unions were perfect. He didn't say everything was hunky-dory. But he said, compared to everybody else and what was going on, the unions were trying to build more interracial solidarity. And in doing so, we built a powerful labor movement on whose shoulders everyone in this room is standing. And so here we were. This is 1936. We've made no progress for three decades. In two years, the labor movement doubles in size. And by 1945, it triples in size. I got a workshop that spends a lot of time unpacking this story, but it's not for today. I'm just saying, it, they did what was considered impossible. You could not double the size of the labor movement in two years. Can't be done. Well, they did. I'm not saying we can do it today. But by God, let's dream big. And let's plan big. Let's plan for that 70% market share. OK? Well, it'll never happen. Well, it'll never happen if we don't, if we don't try. So 1963, how many of you have heard of uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech? Raise your hand. OK, everybody's heard his speech. Okay, I was 14 years old. It helped change my life. I'm living in this racist neighborhood. I got the bigots outside every day trying to blame it on black folk. And I hear this other guy saying, I have a dream that someday the descendants of slaves will walk hand in hand with the descendants of slave owners in the long march to the Red Hills of Georgia toward a more beloved and blessed community. And I get goosebumps. And I get a little choked up uh, saying that 54 years later. But I, I heard a hope there of like, Maybe there's a way out for us, too. You know, because I didn't, I didn't like it. It felt like we were stuck. And was there going to be a future for me? And what was that future going to look like? Because some people said, if you keep this up, you're headed toward the joint. And I wasn't really interested. I didn't like people telling me what to do. And I knew in the joint that they told you what to do 24-7. You know, they, a lot of them weren't particularly nice about it, perhaps. And so. One of the great tragedies of this day is the national AFL-CIO refused to endorse the march. OK, well, what does that say? That's not a particularly profound, positive thing to, to reflect, but it's true. There were, uh, there were some unions, the auto workers, the garment workers out of New York City. My wife is from New York City. Her father was a garment worker union leader. They brought down about 60 buses of people from New York City because they were standing saying, we got to unite, you know, unite, fight, same struggle, same fight. We're all in this together. And so labor, there's a wedge that's being driven in our movement that will ultimately be very negative to us. And President Meany, who is the head of the AFL-CIO ten, 10 years later, says something that is incredibly brain dead. I used to worry about the size of the membership. I stopped worrying about it because it doesn't matter. The only fellow, who, the organized fellow is the only fellow who matters. He says this when 73% of the workers in the United States are non-union. Hello, I don't have to take my shoes off to be able to count past 10. But I do know that if three quarters of the people in our union members saying that they don't matter and you don't need to organize them is a recipe for disaster. Okay? And the organized fellow, a fellow is a guy. Well, that means women don't matter. Well, to sort of speak to the who is we and we is who, that question is hugely important. And this is right out of the mouth of the number one guy in the American labor movement. And our movement was standing aside during the titanic struggles for civil rights in the 1960s when the need for racial justice was front and center and, and the justice for other folks. And so what's starting to happen our labor movement is weakening. Here we were in 1945, after that great uprising in the 30s and early 40s, and it's starting to decline in power. And by 1971, it's down here at 27%. We're still strong, but the direction is the wrong direction. 
And the question is, which way is it going to go after 1971? And then one of the great evil geniuses of American history, Lewis Powell. OK. How many people have read Lewis Powell's memo? Raise your hand. I hope every one of you Google this and go home and read it. August 23rd, 1971, a guy named Lewis Powell writes his famous memo to a friend he is at the US Chamber of Commerce. He's the former president of the American Bar Association. He sits on the boards of 11 major US corporations. And he says, I have a grand strategy by which, if followed by corporate America, we will crush organized labor, we will reassert economic and political domination over the United States, and we will return to those glory days when we have the whip hand. Now, I'm using street talk here. He was more eloquent than what I'm saying. But that's what he was saying. And he said, it's a decades-long strategy. We're going to play the long game. The people we're fighting with play the short game. The people with the long game always beat the short game. Because you change the rules at some point so that the old short game doesn't work, which is what they've done with labor laws, right? You got a right to organize, but you can't make it work. That's their part of their long game. Win the war of big ideas. Convince the American people that government is bad, unions are evil, they're overpaid, they're a bunch of lazy guys, three guys on a shovel, you know the story, right? And so on and so forth. Corporations are good. We're gonna have, we're gonna build a national idea machine, Fox News, we're gonna harness the power of corporate media because they own it. And they're going to build think tanks to put their ideas forward. And they built this machine in the 1970s. This is all very well documented by a number of books. And unlimited amounts of money and always be on the attack. And when you get the guy down, never let him get back up. Guy, gal, whomever. Once they're on the pavement, you beat them into submission so they can never rise again. Two months after he wrote this memo, President Nixon appointed him to the US Supreme Court. OK? I'm not making this guy up. I'm not some weirdo wing nut who's got a 30-watt light bulb in a dim apartment somewhere making stuff up and pounding it out on the uh, face, you know, faceless Facebook. He really existed. He really wrote it. Nixon put him on the Supreme Court for 15 years. He was the architect of the uh, constitutional law doctrine that money equals free speech, which is part of what the, the nightmare that we're into today. He was that grand architect. They put their guy on the Supreme Court to help shift the judicial direction of the country. And corporate America put his plan into place. If you don't read it, you will not read the playbook that our enemies have been using against us for the last 45 years. OK, I challenge every one of you to Google it and read it and then reflect on what is going on here. In fact, I got involved in the labor movement in 1971. It's the year this guy wrote this memo. You know, it's like, I hate him. He was an evil genius, though. We need to understand the game films of our side, but also the game films and the playbooks of the people who were out to destroy us. And I showed you early on the war on workers, prevailing wage, PLAs, right to work. They got a game plan. It's been in place for decades, and they're rolling it forward. But the American people are waking up. Okay, So what's this class warfare look like? We've got to get rid of you, front and center. We've got to promote free trade and move all the manufacturing overseas. Okay, We've got to buy, money with, buy elections with big money. Everybody in here has a constitutional right to spend $100 million of your own money on the election this November. And if you choose not to do so, that's your constitutional right, too. So we're all equal, right? According to the Supreme Court, we all have that constitutional right. Now, you chose to spend your 100 million somewhere else, but whatever. Okay, well, clearly, we don't have the 100 million. You make it more difficult to vote, deregulate Wall Street. That worked pretty well back in 2008. Look out. My God, it's collapsing on us. By the way, how many people know somebody who got foreclosed? Got foreclosed, lost their house after 2008. Yeah, a lot of people, including a family friend of ours, partially disabled, 
We paid our mortgage for a year and finally we let him go. We said we just can't, we can't carry you forever. Hardest phone call we ever made, other than the death of somebody in our family. Cut the social programs for the poor and the unemployed. You know how they are, they're all a bunch of takers, slackers. Cut taxes on the corporations, they just did it again, and the wealthy. Privatized government, and last but not least, divide and conquer. Has anybody ever heard any of this before? Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't heard this before, you've either been in a coma for 40 years or you've been in solitary for 40 years. This is their game plan for 40 years, and they keep running it. Okay? And it's worked pretty well. But people are waking up. And we have the opportunity to turn the tide because the truth will ultimately defeat the lies. Because people want to move toward the light rather than move toward the darkness. So we have to provide that light, and we have to provide the truth, and have the courage to be truth tellers and challenge people that we know to stand up and be counted. So now I want to do a walking graph exercise. This is about, this is an exercise that's going to graphically demonstrate what happened to working people and their incomes when we had strong unions, and what happens when our unions got a lot weaker. So could I get six volunteers? I will not embarrass anybody. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do a tap dance. But could I get six of you to come up here and stand with your toes on this imaginary line facing this direction? Come on up. So we're going to look at the period of 1947 to 1979 and we'll figure out a way to work around this. You're the poorest 20% of American families. You're the lower middle class. Derek is the middle class. John is the upper middle class. Dustin is the upper, is the richest 20%. And Daniel is the richest 5%. Okay? Okay, okay. Whoa, you know, we're going negative. We're going negative. We don't know what's in his heart. We just know what's in his wallet. Okay, so let's not go negative right off the bat. We'll, we'll find out later. We'll interrogate you. Now, your name again? Joshua. Joshua represents the poorest 20% of American families. Between 1947 and 1979, the average income of the families that you represent went up 116% after inflation. So the purchasing power of your family's income more than double. Is that making sense to everybody? Got to say yes. yes. Okay, I need you to take 11 and a half steps, and I'd like you to end up right here. That'll be 11 and a half steps. Big steps. Oh, well, you know, well, big shoes. yeah, big shoes. And Fidencio represents the lower middle class, went up 100%. Take 10 steps further and end up right about here. You went up 111%, take 11 steps, and you're right next to the first brother, about six inches behind him. John's went up 114%, you're standing right next to the other two brothers. Okay, income more than double. Dustin's went up 99%, you should end up right here, Dustin, next to Fidencio. And your name again? Daniel. Daniels went up only 86%, oh. so you should end up right here. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Back up two inches. <laughs> sometimes people cheat. I'm not accusing you of cheating. I just said sometimes it's happened. Okay. Do you get the picture here? A rising tide is lifting all boats. Everybody's income basically doubled over a 32-year period after inflation, so purchasing power doubles, and income inequality narrows because the richest 5% grew the smallest amount. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay, everybody back to the starting line. And let me have my cards. These are precious. They cost hundreds of dollars to make. <laughs> Out of my own pocket, yeah. Okay, that was 47 to 79 when the labor movement was strong. And then the next 35 years, when labor gets weaker, blank starts to happen. 
Okay, we'll pass them out again. You guys are doing a great job. There might be some work in the film industry at some point. So, um, Josh, I got terrible eyes. Okay. Josh's income went back 12%, moved back one step plus five and a half inches. Another half an inch. Good, very good. Fidencio went up 3%, moved six and a half inches. Oh, that was way too much. Okay, that's good. Derek went up 12%, come out to about here. John went up 26%, come out to about here. Justin, uh, Dustin, come out to about here, 52%. And Daniel, I'm terrible at names, 78%, come out to about here. Sorry, guys. Okay. okay. You know, uh, now let's not pick on people, you know, because everybody's got feelings. Okay. Does anybody notice a difference between this time and last time? Oh, yeah. What was that again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I've embarrassed myself. I made a mistake. I need one more volunteer. Can I get one more person to come up and help? Donna. Okay. Well. Okay. So Donna. Donna has volunteered. Okay. No, you got to go back to the starting line. Starting line is right there. Okay. Donna represents. Well, <laughs> oh, we got professional smart blanks here. Or what? I thought I was in charge of sarcasm. It's Jennifer. Pardon me. <laughs> Jennifer represents the richest 100th of the richest 1% of American families. She represents 13,000 families. Their average annual income is $37 million a year. If they're getting 5% return on their portfolio, their average wealth is $700 million. Okay? Her, her group's average income went up 315%. I need you to take 31 and a half steps, take good sized steps, and count them off. Say it loud. Make a right. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up to the and a half steps. I told you that some people cheat. I'm not saying you did. Okay. Does anybody notice a difference now? Yeah. Okay. Now, this is a democracy here. We're going to have a public opinion poll. Don't vote until you know your choices. This is based on your real life experience, not some fantasy land you want to live in. Would you prefer an economy that does this? That's choice number one, don't vote yet. Or would you prefer an economy that does that? All in favor of number one, say yes. Yes! All in favor of number two, say yes. Yes. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Everybody is entitled to their opinion. I've done this exercise 200 times. This is the only person who voted yes. yes. And he's entitled to his opinion. But I have, this is a good news, bad news exercise. The good news is, is I've probably done this for 15,000 people, so it's been 15,000 wanted number one, and one wanted number two. The good news is that everybody seems to want number one. The bad, that's the good news. The bad news is, is this is what's going on and corporate America is gonna keep cramming this down our throats until we make them stop. You get this story here? Yeah. Everything that we're struggling against can be explained with these three graphs of what happened here that even though we're producing more wealth, it sure ain't coming our way. You with me on this? Yeah. Let's give a round of applause for our participants who did a hell of a job. And I would point out that the amount of anger in our country about what I just showed you is enormous, okay? Legitimately so. Of what happened to once upon a time when a rising tide was lifting all boats and income inequality between whites and people of color was narrowing and between men and women were narrowing, but there was a rising tide. 
What happened to that? It went away. But it didn't magically happen. It happened because we lost power. And that the game has been changed with the Powell Memo being a critical element. Paul Weirich, another one of the gang that arose after the Powell Memo. I don't want everybody to vote. Our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. You know, I'm from Chicago and I like people getting in my face and telling me what they think. This guy's coming right at you and going, we're trying to figure out a way to discourage people from voting by either making it harder to vote or convincing them it doesn't make any difference. This is profoundly undemocratic. It cuts away at the very foundations of what our democracy is supposed to be. And funded by big corporate money, this is Koch brother money that founded the Heritage Foundation. They're playing for keeps. Okay, and 100 years ago, they were using lynchings and out and out brutal murders. Now they're using the pen and votes in legislatures and, and stacking the courts to pull this off. But the effect, the intention is the same thing, is to steal enough votes so that the will of the majority will not be expressed, okay? They're serious. And the Koch brothers, Spent 400 million in 2012, they spent 900 million. 900 million. I would argue they're scared because they know that the people are waking up. And by God, they better pour every dollar they can find into the game because when we wake up, we are the sleeping giant that's going to go, we've had enough of this. And we're going to build a new future that looks different than the future that's being stuffed down our throats that we just saw walk off in front of us. There's a lot of human misery. These two brothers over here that were going backwards and didn't go anywhere, they represent 45 million American families. Yeah, so you're driving up down I-5, two out of every five cars going by or people are going backwards. And they're working more hours than they were 35 years ago. Okay, it's not like get a job, I already got three of them, what the hell are you talking about, man? Oh, why don't you get a fourth one? Oh, wait a minute, that's for your kid. That'll be his or her third job. Right? This is real life. These are the lives of the people that many of us love and care about. And I include myself in all of this. Our family's not exempt from this. And so what do they do to make it more difficult to vote? All of the light-colored states, by 2012, they made it more difficult to vote in those states. And by 2016, the dark red ones, they made it more difficult to vote. So there's a systematic national campaign to make it more difficult to vote. And who's it disproportionately affect? People of color, women, low-wage workers, students, young people, and seniors. Okay? Yeah, they got a game plan. And if we let them pull this off, and they may not be very effective in Washington State right now, which is where I am, but if you're out in Idaho or Wyoming and other places, there's game on where they're trying to figure out how to make this, I see some people nodding their heads like I'm not talking through my hat. Okay? I'm a truth teller here. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. I know who I voted for, but I'll keep it to myself while I'm publicly speaking. When Mexico sends us its people, they're not sending us their best. They're bringing drugs and crime. They're rapists. And I assume some are good people. I can never apologize for the truth. This is, he is channeling the bigotry, the strategic bigotry of Woodrow Wilson of 100 years ago. He changed the names from Eastern and Southern Europeans, the Mexicans, and Latinos. Mexico, okay, in this case, speaking specifically to Mexico. I looked up and did research about the crime rates between native-born Americans, uh, people in the U.S. with papers, and undocumented. The crime rate among uh, Americans who were born here is three times as high as it is for immigrants. We're talking percentages. And this was from a, a, an institute, the Cato Institute, that was funded by the Koch brothers. So they don't even have evidence to back this, back this claim up that by having immigrants here that the crime rates are worse. Okay. You can disagree with me, but I'll pull out my facts and say, let's tell the truth. So this kind of hatred is intended to get all these people here who are going backwards and sideways ticked off at somebody else in those same groups. 
well, this guy over here is running off with all the dough, right? And see if we can play Stump the Chumps again, which was the game of 100 years ago. And it has huge consequences for us. And of course, the election was stolen, according to Mr. Trump. He presented no evidence. The New York Times contacted all 50 secretaries of states and asked them, most of whom were Republicans, and asked them, did you have, do you have any evidence of massive voter fraud? 49 of them came back and said no, and the only one that didn't respond was Kansas. Okay? So you just make up a big lie, no proof, and you bash away at immigrants, and you tell me that I'm supposed to hate somebody who's got darker skin than me, who may speak less than the English that I speak. Okay? It's the same divide and conquer and strategic bigotry and racism being used again. And the question is, are we going to fall for this? This is a famous quote from Nazi Germany by a guy named Martin Niemöller. Niemöller was a, uh, a Lutheran theologian and churchman. And he said, first they came for the communists, and I did nothing because I was not one of them. Then they came for the socialists, and I said nothing because I wasn't one of them. Then they came for the trade unionists. Then they came for the lesbians and gays. Then the intellectuals. Then the gypsies. And then the Jews. And one day they came for me, and there was no one to stand with me. And the lesson of Nazi Germany was you don't wait until the boot is on your throat to stand up. You stand up when you see the first person with the boot on their throat and say, get it off. You had a little, mic you had micro lessons about that, about in the workplace, where somebody's being bullied and harassed. But what happens when it's going on at the society-wide, at the national level, okay? I'm not saying we're in a pre-Nazi Germany period in the United States right now. Don't interpret anything I say to say that. But we're in a dangerous moment where when I ask you very early on, are you worried about rising racism, sexism, and bigotry, there was a big war and everybody basically was saying yes, right? So you're clearly aware that it's game on now with the resurgence of let's stir up the pot and let's stir up this hatred and bigotry and get us split up as a people so that this game that I just showed you can be played. And most of us are not doing so well in that game. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now we're going to have another little exercise here. And this is about the United States. And I'm going to write down your answers, and I'm going to add a few if you uh, don't include some that I thought of myself. But let's think about the United States now. There's all sorts of groups that are under, that are being attacked and being blamed. Mexicans. OK, so let, let's start out. Mexicans. Muslims. Muslims. Disabled? Redheads, just kidding. Okay. Yeah, I'm sick of that. Is there, is there another redhead in the room? Or just another wise guy? Okay, who else? The poor. What? The poor? African Americans. African Americans. Women. Women. The second. Native Americans. LGBTQ, I know I'm LGBTQ unions. Just, I know, uh, I, I missed some. Retirees. Retirees. Yeah. Immigrants. Immigrants. Veterans. Vets. Who else? Small businesses. Small businesses. Middle class. Unions, we already got, but I'll give a double check by it. Working class. Disadvantaged. Disadvantaged. Okay. Schools. Homeless. Homeless. Media. News media. Youth. Drug addicts. Media. Okay. So the point here is we got, a, we got a long list, okay? And maybe we didn't get everybody, and if we left somebody off the list, 
We didn't get Asian Pacific Islanders. Okay. We got a long list. And if we had more time, we could drill more deeply into this whole dynamic. But you look at this and go, this is the salad that I'm talking about. This is the salad that needs to be tied together with love, tolerance, and respect. Not groups of people that need to be abused and blamed so that this group can accuse them of being the reason that these guys are having a hard time. Am I making sense here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's the divide and conquer, and they keep bringing, we didn't mention trans, well, transgender, they're in here, but you know, that sort of popped out of nowhere about th two, three years ago. Like, where'd this come from? They have a right to be who they are, in my opinion. You know, and all of a sudden, they're going to get thrown out of the military even though they've served honorably and did nothing wrong? Really? Well, wow, once you start down that road, then it's like, well, which group's next? Okay? So sisters and brothers, we're at a dangerous moment. But what I showed you from 100 years ago, a lot of our ancestors, and I'm talking about ancestors who look like me, a lot of us stumbled on this question and we were buying into this. And we couldn't find the unity that we needed. And today, we get a chance to make a different choice. Okay? And I'm not saying, I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't do. But I hope that we all stand up and say, these are part of my human, they, for me, these are all part of my human family. They're different than me in different ways, but I want to learn about them and understand them and respect them and go, I don't know much about you and your people, but I'd like to know more. You know, and I'd like to share with you my background too and, and learn from each other and go, wow, I know more than I did before. And my life is richer because I, I know people from more diverse backgrounds. And so if we really believe that an injury to one is an injury to all, which is one of the great labor slogans of the last 150 years, then we look at this list and go, which of these groups, when they're being injured, do we remain silent? None. Okay, none. Because if we remain silent, then we don't believe it that much. Okay? And so as the attacks mount, I would argue that we need to say to each other, you are my sister, you are my brother. I'm going to be with you. And back it off. Not just in the workplace, which is important, one-on-one, -on -one, but in this larger dynamic. Am I making sense to you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is not the kind of America where all these people are being attacked. This is not the America that I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of everybody can be respected and treated fairly and not blame for things that, are not, that they are not responsible for. So today we got class warfare. They're buying our government. They're stealing our right to vote. They're buying elections. They're bashing immigrants. And they're attacking all sorts of groups. And we just listed a bunch of them. So you did really good. You got an A plus on this one. Okay, so in a pass fail, you've, you've gotten over the hurdle. Okay, learning from our past allows us to make different choices today and tomorrow. And learning from the past about where divide and conquer weakened us, let us not make those mistakes again. So I want to show you some examples of stuff that are going on. 70 percent of the American people support a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who have not committed felonies. That's a fact. Multiple polls that show that. And a solid almost two-thirds opposed building this Mexican wall. Okay? I'm not saying you have to agree with me, but this is the data on the ground. I think you guys, guys and gals, deserve a huge round of applause for you voting to be a sanctuary union. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that this didn't happen overnight, but the learning curve was there, and it was time to stand up. And I want to say, I'm going to intervene with a personal thing here. I donate all my earnings for my speaking gigs to progressive community-based organizations and candidates and people in need. And I'm going to be asking you to split my speaking fee between the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, which is the main legal group that's working to defend immigrants in the Pacific Northwest, 
and uh, uh, Familius Unitas Cone Justicia, which is a new farm workers union up in Skagit and Whatcom counties that I've worked with. Uh, <laughs> Because my family is standing on the shoulders of previous generations of unionists, and we're doing okay. I don't need the money. I charge, because I want to make sure that everybody else is doing their part, but I'm passing it on to other groups that are allies. And it's part of trying to walk the talk as best I know how. This is a quote from President Trump from the AFL-CIO. It's time to draw the line. Some people are still getting hurt in our communities because of the color of their skin and it's not right. This is a tough issue. This is not easily fixed, but we can't pretend that this hasn't been a problem in our country for way too long, okay? And how we move forward on it, easier said than done, but by God, it is not only something that we need to fix, but it is critical if we're gonna build our power and, and create that salad where everybody's in. And the whole issue about transgenders in the military. Two thirds of the American people say they should be allowed to serve. And even 55% of voters in military households agree. Why would you kick somebody out of the military if they served honor honorably? For what reason? I don't like your color of your hair. You parted on the wrong side. You wear your baseball hat backwards. I mean, really. I look at this and go, we can do better than this. You with me on this? Yep. Yeah. 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 Every woman in America has a right to go to work, has a human right to go to work and be free from discrimination and harassment. End of story. Okay? This needs to come to a complete and total screeching halt. It's gone on since the time we had employers in the United States. And it's time to say no more. And of course, in Charlottesville, Virginia, in March, white supremacists, KKK, neo-Nazis are marching. This looks like a rally of the, either the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazis, I'll be quite candid. My wife is half Jewish. Uh, she's a quarter Ethiopian, and boy, when this happened, the tension in our household just went through the roof, okay? And one of the chances was at that rally, we will not be ruled by Jews. Hello? Really? Where did this come from? This is the kind of hatred and bigotry of 100 years ago that some people feel emboldened to bring forward. And I say, we need to completely route these people. And I mean, they have a legal right to say what they want to say, but we cannot let this go unchallenged. Because we've seen in other countries, and in our own history, when we didn't stand up, what would happen? United we stand, divided we fall, and of course the famous quote by Benjamin Franklin, we will all either hang together or we will surely hang separate. And by gosh, we get to choose. Are we gonna hang together? Or are we gonna get, keep getting whipped while they help destroy our movement? And you're obviously trying to push it completely the other way by trying to get the 70% market share and building more power in your communities and understanding the need to ally with our immigrant sisters and brothers and I'm sure other community groups that are under attack. And in doing so, we help to create that beloved and blessed community that Dr. King talked about so many years ago. And you know, it's time to stand up and be counted. I say to folks, if you're up in the stands watching the game, you're in the wrong part of the stadium, get down on the field and start playing. And I say to people, how many people do you know who don't have three hours a month that they could dedicate to the union or dedicate to some community fight to make your community better? I'm not here to judge people, but I, I don't know if I know hardly anybody who couldn't find three hours a month if they wanted. 
but maybe they're so busy they can't. I can't really judge them. But to sort of push people of quit complaining and help help join in our struggle. And of course, the women's marches in 2017 and 2018, an outpouring, the rally in Seattle was 150,000. It was the largest demonstration in the history of the state of Washington. I happened to be in Eastern Oregon doing a training for the electricians, and I missed it. But it had been planned for months, and I said I followed through with my commitments, but boy, was I sorry to miss it. It was inspiring. We had four generations of my family, my 92-year-old uh, mother-in-law, all the way down to my five-year-old grandson, all marching together, because we teach them. And you know the old slogan about one day longer in the fight for justice? I don't know how many of you remember, but in 2005, Alaska Airlines fired 1,100 baggage handlers and fuelers and cabin cleaners and broke the union down at SeaTac. They were making 20 bucks an hour with a good wage and benefits and a good pension. They fired them all and replaced them with $9 an hour, no benefit contractors. They fought 11 years. That's where the fight for 15 came from because they couldn't, they couldn't get a union contract under the Railway Labor Act rules that I described that they're using in Iowa. And so they said, let's raise the minimum wage in SeaTac to 15 bucks an hour. We'll get a raise from nine to 15 bucks by a vote of the people. And they did it, they won by 120 votes. And we finally got a contract that took 4,000 days, 4,000 days of struggle before they got a new contract down at SeaTac, which is pretty close to where we are. Are we in SeaTac right now? Yeah, here we are. We're ground zero. You know? Oh, hello, where am I? Am I in Chicago? <laughs> Where's my, where are the mobs doing there? But the point being, sisters and brothers, right here in this city, the fight for $15 hour minimum wage that says if, you're, if you work full time in America, you shouldn't be poor, it started right here. And it started because of union busting and broken labor laws where they couldn't figure out a way to get a union in because of how wrong and broken these laws are. Yeah, we owe a debt of gratitude to these people. And my wife and I, we came down here, you know, knocking on doors. And I mean, I'm not trying, I'm not a hero. I'm just a regular old flat footer there that's out there, you know, pounding the bricks from time to time because it's Saturday and it's time to go doorbell down in SeaTac and let's win this summer. This was a fire at the uh, Richmond, uh, California plant. Uh, it's a uh, Chevron, huge explosion 20, in 2012. The building trades in California pushed the law through its uh, Senate Bill 54 that requires that every skilled worker uh, doing maintenance or new construction in a refinery in California has to be a state registered apprentice or have gone through an apprenticeship program. Hello. There's an idea. And it's a public safety thing because I don't want to be driving up I-80 and what, you know, have the place blow up while I'm driving by. I want to make sure that the people who are in there doing the maintenance know what they're doing. So different ideas being tried in different places. They tried to repeal federal Davis-Bacon, the federal prevailing wage law that would have affected everybody in this room. We beat it. Every Democrat voted against it. 178 Republicans voted to repeal it. Let's call out who did what. And Kathy McMorris Rogers over in Spokane and Jamie Butler Herrera down here in Vancouver voted to repeal it. And I'm not telling you who you ought to endorse in the 2018 elections, but I hope everybody hits the bricks and sends these people to the unemployment lines. Because if they'd gotten this through, some of your members would have been on the unemployment lines, right? We got Dan Newhouse to vote uh, to protect Davis Bacon. Okay. Good. There, it's not a lost cause with everybody, but by God, let's make people pay if we're going to put a knife to our throats. And in Iowa, you know, or in Missouri, they push through right to work. They have an initiative process like we do in Washington State. I think you do in Oregon. I don't know about other states in your, uh, in your sixth uh, state council. They needed 90,000 uh, signatures to get on the ballot. They got 310,000. Game on in 2018 in Missouri. Let's see if we can roll back a right to work law. And if you got an extra 20 bucks, send them the money. Because they need some money 
to get to the, hire some staff to go out there and pound the streets and let's beat these union busters and begin to roll this back. It would only be the second time in 70 years that we have repealed the state right to work law. Okay? It's game up. So they didn't give up. They got up off the deck and said, okay, re rematch. Mr. Trump, I'm going to speed through this so we have time for discussion. He said there'd be no cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and everybody's going to get insurance. <coughs> Turned out the three plans last year, 24, 26, and 28 million, we're going to lose insurance and hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts in Medicare and Medicaid. <coughs> okay? Here they were. This is the Republican Congressional Budget Office saying this, so I'm not making it up. We beat it three times. Okay, it's like when you had the field goal. Maybe that's more like soccer. Okay, three goals. We gotta keep fighting. We gotta keep fighting forward. Not just defend what we got, but say we can do better, we can make things better. And of course we got the 2018 elections and let's get rid of all the people who are anti-union and anti-worker. We're near the end here and then we'll have a short discussion. A hundred years ago, a lot of union members and a lot of working people, and I'm talking white union members here and white working class people, made tragic mistakes by buying into bigotry and hatred <coughs> and intolerance. They hurt themselves, they hurt our movement, and they hurt our country. We have another situation that has emerged today. And we all get a chance to look at what happened in the past and decide what do we do today? This is our choice. This is the only quote in the workshop that's mine. The ultimate, the ultimate test of a person, a union, a movement, and a people is not whether or not we get knocked down. It is what do we do when we get up? Are we stronger? Are we smarter? Are we more determined? And are we more united? This is always our choice. Sisters and brothers, are you ready to stand up with me yeah. in a united way and let's take our country back so that we can hand a better today and tomorrow to our children and grandchildren and the people that we love so that the future will become bright again. Are you with me on this? Yeah. 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 over to this real quick. Check out my website. It's got videos, PowerPoints, all sorts of stuff that you might find useful. Like I said, I'm going to give this PowerPoint to the Regional Council uh, so that you can use it as you wish. You want to use it for whatever purposes. I believe in freeware, so there's no charge for using it. Uh, spread the word. I'm willing to go anywhere and talk to anybody where it makes sense, where there's going to be a good turnout try and educate and motivate and inspire folks. I got multiple workshops that I do. And like I said, this isn't about me making money. This is about me paying forward the blessings and benefits that generations of unionists and working people and the civil rights movement and our other community allies gave to me and my family. This is a labor of love. I also obviously love doing it. But the point is, if you got somewhere in Wyoming that makes sense to bring me, I'll be there. You got some place in Idaho, I'll go, as long as it fits into my schedule, okay? Because I believe, and I'm doing this all over the country, everywhere I go, working people are asking the same questions of what happened here. They don't like it, they want something different, and they're trying to figure out how to do things differently. And if I can be of help to people, and helping us give them ideas and, and sorting that out, I want to do that. Okay? Yes. So who'd like to share? What, what came up for you? Uh, is this worthwhile? Did it help you? Get you thinking?
We, we got our warts and we got our dirty laundry. Yeah. What else? There's a good perspective adjustment. I'm sorry? There's a good perspective adjustment. Let's say a little bit more. Is there a mic? Why don't you use the microphone? And it, it was a good perspective adjustment. Okay, and just give me a couple sentences. On, uh, what does that mean to you? Uh, I think understand where we've been, what we've done, how we got where we're at, and how we can go mm -hmm. going, uh, how we can move going forward. What make, what might make a difference? So history is critical. To know about it. Yeah, to go farther back. Yeah. Who said that? Same word. To go farther back into our history. You know, there's a lot of members that. You know, there's a lot of our members that don't realize where our history back to Peter J. McGuire, you know, right. is actually taking part of the back. You know, we've got this 70% that we're striving for, and like a lot of your uh, stuff shows 40% below, and, you know, we're going for that 70% mm -hmm. what it's going to take to get there. Right. So there's a lot of work ahead of us, but should set goals at the top. If you're never going to get to the top of the mountain, if you don't aim for it. Yeah. Yes. We're wondering what the tipping point's going to be when people are pissed off enough to get out in the streets, right? Their lives aren't that great. They're not bad enough yet. So will it be like, we actually go after Medicare and Social Security and impact our elderly parents? What will the tipping point be in history where the people will finally rise up? I mean, personally, I don't think it's actually bad enough yet for us to you know, get that type of action. I think there's things we can do now to create the movement and start the movement, but something I think is gonna happen bad, unfortunately. Teeth are gonna get knocked out, we're gonna get punched in the nose, right? Like you said, we're down on the ground, we're gonna get back up. So I'm, I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on what you think a tipping point might be. Boy, if, if, I, if, if, I, knew, if I knew I had the right answer to that, <laughs> I, I'd be a genius and I'm clearly not. Uh, let me start by saying that one of the things about uh, studying history is it's only when you look back that you can see where the tipping point was, yeah. right? And so, you know, in retrospect, you can look back at 1937, and that's a sit-down strikes in Flint, Michigan by the Auto Workers Union, which exploded and, and roared across the country. You go, well, there's, there was a tipping point. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look back even as I'm looking forward and going, Oh, were those women's marches part of a tipping point where millions of women are sort of standing up and going, you know, I've been getting jerked around at work for way, 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 way too long, and I've had it. And all of a sudden, there may be a rising of the women in a, in a very powerful way. Is that part of it? I think so. Is, is that the day? I don't know. But I think with all these different groups, there are tipping points. And, and so if we start talking to each other, the likelihood of building a multi-movement tipping point goes way up. Um, and to me, uh, people talk about resistance and fighting back. I say, yes, we need to fight back, but we have to fight forward. And what I mean by that is if I'm only fighting to hang on to what I've got, if what I've got is kind of so-so, well, that's not that inspiring, but if we're fighting forward to a better future for our kids, and what does that look like, the more we can flesh out, what does this desired America that we want look like? I think we will inspire more and more people because, yeah, I want that too. And I think what Dr. King did, and I think what made in part his language, and he certainly wasn't the only person, but he inspired us with, I have a dream that someday black and white folk are going to walk hand in hand and we're going to figure this out and make it better. And that's guiding, that's guiding people 50 years later, still trying to do that. So I don't, I don't know the answer per se, but I think connecting the dots between your struggle and your struggle and your struggle and going, wait a minute, that's all part of the same fight. It's got different elements to it. Uh, I, to me, I think that's the way we are going to create that tipping point. Um, and I think these 2018 elections are a huge opportunity. 
And I go to a lot of dinner parties where people are complaining constantly. And when they're at my house, I have some control over them because you're my guests. And so I started politely saying, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a new rule tonight. I hope this is okay with you. We all can complain about what we don't like for 15 minutes. Let's all do it at the same time. We can talk as loud as we want. We don't have to listen to each other. But let's just totally blow it up and roar. And then after the 15 minutes of stuff, we stop and then talk about what are we going to do about it. Because it's sort of like, I'm, I'm tired of like, oh my God, did you see what they did today? Well, I don't need any more information to convince me I need to get active. And it's like, what are we going to do about it? So how do we sort of take people's frustration and sense of discontent and turn that into, if you get active, you transform yourself as well. Because you can be victimized, but you don't need to be a victim. And I think we're trying to change the world one person at a time, even as we change it a million at a time. I don't know, it's a long-winded answer, but that, that's where I find hope. And particularly among young people. Oh my gosh. You know, I am humbled by what I see a lot of young people doing. Um, and to encourage them and say, boy, my generation made a lot of mistakes, I'll tell you what they are. Don't repeat ours. You'll make some others, but you don't need to. You don't need to run into the ditch doing some of the things we did. A couple more thoughts and we'll wrap up. Right here. I just want to say thank you uh, for coming. Uh, what a man says makes him a great communicator, and you are. But what a man does shows his character. And you coming here, not taking a fee, willing to split that fee uh, among the groups you, you stated just tells me the kind of man you are. And uh, I'm convinced if there were a hundred of you doing this with the same passion, sold out, we would kick the gates of the anti-union and break the union where it used to be in this generation. I really believe that. You just created a hot dog. <laughs> Thank you, and, and let, me, let me close with three comments. One, I don't have a, a, un, I don't have a Carpenter's Union t-shirt, <laughs> and if anybody's got a large Carpenter's Union t-shirt, I wish you would send it to me. I'll take that as my official speaking fee, because I don't have one to wear. So, okay, well, whatever. If another local, I'll, I'll take one of theirs, too. So I'd like, I'd like a Carpenter's Union t-shirt. Uh, two, one of my workshops is a train-the-trainer workshop that trains people to do what I do. Okay? And so, you get a group of people together that you want to train on how to do this, what I'm doing. I'll help train people. There's videos to use, so you don't have to be a master of history. And the third is, the other workshop that I do that I want to toss your way as an idea is called Speaking from the heart, the power of our using the power of our personal stories to inspire activism and win community allies. And it is a it is a skill building exercise where people practice telling their personal stories about what caused them to stand up and get active. And how to use those stories to draw out of other people their discontent and to help encourage them to stand up. <coughs> And you saw me demonstrate that when I started today, when I, I, I thought to myself, I'm a 68-year-old, native-born, straight, monolingual, Irish pasty boy, white guy talking to this audience, right? And, and I'm not a carpenter, and I'm not for the building trades. So there's plenty of ways that people could look at me and go, what'd you bring this guy for? So I have, in three or four minutes, a chance to go, let me show you the content of my heart and then you be the judge on whether or not I'm your ally. And so the, the way, and I have several stories that I tell, and everybody in this room has a personal story or stories about what happened to you, your family, and your people that caused you to stand up. And so when people say, well, who are you? I don't start out by saying, I'm an economic justice and labor educator, and I used to be the 
U.S. Secretary of Labor's regional representative under President Obama, you know, and blah, 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 all these job titles, I start out with, well, let me tell you about what happened to me that made me decide I was going to work to make the world better. And it's a personal story. Everybody in this room has got a story like that. And the more effective we are in leading with those kinds of stories when we're talking to people, it opens up their hearts. Because everybody wants to be able to tell their story and have it heard in a respectful way. So those are shameless pitches, but those are other ways that I might be able to be helpful to you. Okay? So, oh my gosh. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sniff test later. <laughs> so I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I am inspired by people like you because you're out on the front lines. You got tough jobs, but you are the people, along with many other people. Oh, in most places this would cost me 20 bucks. <laughs> but I didn't make any money, so I'm not giving any. <laughs> Uh, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. If there are ways that I can help you in the months and years ahead, I want to do that. Uh, you and people like you coming together, we're going to take our country back and hand our kids and our grandkids a better future. What more noble thing can we do in our lives than that? And that is in part what is driving you. And I applaud you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much.